Well, welcome all. This is Joy Burkhard. I am the executive director of 2020 Mom. We're pleased to have you all join us today for today's webinar, Maternal Suicide in the US, the latest research and data collection efforts. Next slide. As I mentioned, my name is Joy Burkhardt and I'm the executive director of 2020 Mom. I'm thrilled to tell you a little bit more about 2020 Mom. And I'll start by sharing our mission. Um, we've been around this month, uh, was our 10 year anniversary or birthday as we like to call it. And we've been working to close gaps in the maternal mental health care uh, system for our last 10 years. Our vision is a healthcare delivery system that routinely detects, treats, and treats maternal mental health disorders for every mother, every time. On the next slide, I wanted to share a little bit about our interest in history in closing gaps specifically around maternal suicide. Uh, I'm gonna start by sharing that we um, noted that there were gaps in data reporting, not just for maternal health, like so many of us knew and maternal mortality generally, but also uh, gaps that we were quite concerned about around the reporting of maternal suicides and became very interested in data collection efforts and also information sharing four years ago when we first outreached the CDC and others to raise this opportunity. You can see on the slide here that we have highlighted um, some of our work in this space, um, blogging on maternal suicide for quite some time, um, and also launched the U.S. Maternal Suicide Awareness Campaign uh, this month, um, several years ago, four years ago as well, during Suicide Prevention Month. And I'd like to introduce quickly Cindy Lee Herrick from our team who runs our maternal suicide efforts. Cindy, hello. Just wanted you to say hi and be able to wave to folks. Thank you for all of your work around this important topic, Cindy. Thank you. Okay, next slide. We wanted to also share some suicide, maternal suicide resources that exist on our website. Um, our most popular and well-attended webinar of all time was this first one listed under webinars, Maternal Suicide, What All Providers and Advocates Should Know. We had um, uh, 1,500 uh, attendees live for that event. We also did another webinar that's listed on that prior slide with the Zero Suicide Institute. Those recordings are available on our website as are additional materials around maternal suicide. We encourage you to take a look. All right, Cindy, we can move on to the next slide. So I wanna go over what we'll cover today. And we're gonna be hearing from our guest speakers about an overview of maternal suicide research and data collection efforts in the US, including the important role of maternal mortality review committees or MMRCs. We're also gonna talk about maternal suicidal ideation, suicide risk factors and racial disparities, and then get to have a little bit of fun together during a fireside chat. Next slide. I'm pleased to get to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Goldman Malor. Um, and I mispronounced that again, even though I practiced. Um, uh, Cedra Goldman Malor has been doing really incredible work in this space. And many of us have seen her work through some incredible um, articles covering her work. Um, she'll talk a little bit about that work, but uh, really um, the headlines that some of you may recall hearing about suicide and overdose being the leading cause of maternal um, mortality, uh, really getting this data on the map in a very big way about 18 months ago, if I recall correctly. So Dr. Goldman Miller, I'm excited to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Joy, for that nice introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure to get to talk to this audience. Um, yep, so I'm Sidra Goldman Miller. Um, I am a professor here at University of California Merced in the Central Valley of California. Um, and I'll, I guess, just launch right in because I know we have a lot of exciting um, stuff to get through um, today. So let's see, next slide. Okay, so I mean, the reason that we're all here today, I think, is that um, we all know that pregnant and birthing persons in the United States die 
at a higher rate than in other high income countries. Um, and I'm, I'm using this term pregnant and birthing persons, I'll probably be shorthanding um, it to um, women for the, the, the other slides. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that, of course, not all pregnant and birthing um, persons identify um, as women. So um, we know that they um, die at higher rates than in other high income countries and that rate has been going up um, and reducing these deaths is now a public health and a clinical priority as it has been for a while. Um, but what often gets kind of lost in this message um, is um, increasing scientific evidence um, that suicide is a surprisingly prevalent um, and potentially an increasing cause of death um, during pregnancy and the first year of postpartum. Um, but this incredibly devastating outcome gets a lot less attention most of the time um, than other kinds of causes of maternal death. Um, okay, next slide. So to get us on kind of the same page when we're, we're talking through um, these these topics. Um, I thought that I would start with um, reviewing sort of a, a few bits of key terminology because there's sort of a lot of terminology in this field. So I just wanted to get everybody on the same page. So when we talk about this term maternal mortality, um, what that specifically refers to is death of a woman while she is pregnant um, or within 42 days or about six weeks of the end of her pregnancy from causes that are specifically related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management itself. There's a lot of you know, kind of specific causes that fall into this category, but some of the biggest ones are hemorrhage, hypertension, um, and venous thromboembolism. Most importantly, the term maternal mortality does not include deaths that come from accidental or incidental causes, and that includes suicide. Okay, next, next term. So pregnancy-related death or PRD, this is basically the same thing as maternal mortality, right? So it's deaths that are due um, to causes related to or aggravated by the pregnancy and its management, but the timeline is extended so that it's, it's not just within pregnancy or the first 42 days, it goes through um, the first year um, postpartum. But again, it still doesn't include suicide. So these two categories are what like most of the research, frankly, in this um, area is are about. Next slide. But what I'm gonna talk about um, today is pregnancy associated death. And that is a broader category that um, refers to the death of a woman while she's pregnant or within one year of the end of the pregnancy from any cause, right? So any cause of death and that includes suicide. And I am gonna be focused um, on pregnancy associated deaths that are due to suicide. So next term. So the last term that I'll talk about, so I'm not really gonna present data on this, but I know um, Cara Zivin is going to, um, so this is important um, to mention, is this term maternal morbidity. So morbidity in general refers to any non-fatal illness or injury. Um, there's a specific category um, called severe maternal morbidity that refers to any unexpected outcomes of um, labor or delivery that result in serious consequences to the woman's health. And so there's a long list of conditions. It includes myocardial infarction, renal failure, eclampsia, sepsis, and other things. This, so this term severe maternal morbidity um, does not generally include um, mental health um, outcomes, um, but as you'll hear today, like it, 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 you know, we, we need to probably expand um, beyond that. Okay, next slide. Okay. So um, like I said, there hasn't been, a, a, there's not still a ton of research in this area. And in particular, the most recent national estimates that we have on suicide rates during pregnancy in the postpartum period are actually from 2010. So that's quite a while ago now. Um, since then, the health of reproductive age women um, has, has changed um, you know, quite a bit potentially. Um, you can see in the graph on the slide um, that suicide rates among reproductive aged women have increased um, fairly substantially over that time. Um, this period also saw um, fertility declines. So it, you know, it's possible that things um, have, have changed um, since 2010. And we need to understand those trends if we want to do, if we, you know, if we want to make a difference, if, we're, if we want to be able to intervene um, where it's most needed. Uh, next bullet. 
So in the work that I'm going to talk about today, so this is this work is not yet published, it's under review, um, but it is not yet published, so it's like not even hot off the presses, because still, still under review. Um, so what my collaborators and I, so this is Claire Marjorson, um, Allison Gemmel, um, and other, um, other women. Um, so what we have been doing is focusing um, on our analysis on pregnancy associated deaths due to suicide as, as well as other causes. And what we were looking at was um, these trends in these deaths um, during this 2010 to 2019 um, period. So we looked at them overall. We also looked at racial and ethnic disparities um, and also looked at um, timing of the deaths in relation to pregnancy. Next slide. Okay, so what did we do? So we used um, both birth certificate data and then death certificate data to identify deaths um, between 2010 and 2019. Um, it's not quite national data. Um, we restricted the analysis to 33 states plus Washington, D.C. Um, that whose death certificate systems used um, uh, this thing called the pregnancy checkbox um, that you know, that signifies is so the coroner fills it out um, or a person related to the coroner. Um, uh, if the woman, uh, if the, the female decedent was known to be pregnant or um, postpartum at the time of her death. Um, so not all states use this checkbox system. So that's why we restricted it to these 33 states. So during this period of 2010 to 2019, there were a total of 11,782 pregnancy associated deaths. So that's all deaths, right? So deaths from any cause. Next bullet. Of those roughly 12,000 deaths, 558 um, were, uh, were due to suicide. So that's roughly five, um, five and a half percent of all pregnancy associated deaths during this period um, were due to suicide. Uh, if we um, sort of compare those deaths to the number of live births during that same time period, which is the denominator that we're usually using here, what that leads to is a ratio of 2.2 suicide deaths um, per 100,000 live births. Um, you can see in the, in the bullet points here, um, some of the other major causes um, of pregnancy associated death during this time. So in the graph on the right, you can see that these pregnancy associated deaths to that are you know, due to suicide, they're fluctuating a bit, but overall they did increase um, by about 32% um, between 2010 to 2019. And there was, there was obviously a spike um, in, in 2018. Next slide. So, sorry, this has, this has bars for multiple causes, but focus your attention on the, the third um, bar here. That's the one due to suicide. So what this is showing is um, when during the pregnancy and postpartum period did these suicide deaths occur? And what you can see is that um, of the women who died by suicide um, in this period, 36% um, of them were pregnant at the time of their death. 13% um, of them were in the first six weeks after the end of their pregnancy. Um, and the, the slight majority, so just over 50%, were um, between the six week period and, and one year. So, so the majority of the deaths, um, these deaths occurred in the postpartum, that first year of postpartum. Next slide. So then we looked at racial and ethnic disparities. So really clearly, it just jumps out at you on this, um, on this graph. American Indian and Alaska Native women have far higher um, uh, ratios, basically rates um, of uh, suicide deaths um, in the, the pregnant and postpartum period compared to any other racial or ethnic group. Um, Non-Hispanic white women have the second highest rate, um, followed by um, Asian Pacific Islander women um, and those who are Black and, and Hispanic. Next slide. So I'm not going to go into the sort of nitty gritty statistical details here, but basically the other thing that we're trying to do in this paper is um, account for the fact that many um, suicide deaths um, among this population are probably underreported. So previous work um, has shown that 
Um, not all of suicide deaths among pregnant and postpartum women are being captured, basically because that checkbox that, you know, where the coroner is checking off, like, yes, this woman, you know, is pregnant or postpartum at the time of her death, that checkbox is actually it's underutilized. And so there's a lot of women um, who die who, for whatever reason, it's not recognized that they um, were pregnant or, or postpartum at the time of death. So other folks have, other researchers have um, created ways of kind of statistically accounting for that. So we applied those methods to our data um, from 2010 to 2018. And if one, what we found is that if you sort of add in the estimated number of like missing suicide deaths, um, suicide would actually account for a far larger proportion of all pregnancy associated deaths um, than the sort of unadjusted estimates show. And so the, if you remember the unadjusted estimates suggested that suicide was um, re responsible for about 5.4% of all pregnancy associated deaths. When we adjust for this kind of this undercounting, actually what we find is that suicide would account for 9.4% of those deaths. Next slide. So um, what we conclude from these findings, and again, these are you know, preliminary, but we, we think they're right. Um, it's, it seems pretty clear that over the last 10 years, suicide among pregnant and postpartum women um, has increased. Um, and it does seem to account for a, a non-negligible, you know, fairly disturbingly substantial proportion of pregnancy associated deaths. Um, we see that most, about 64% of these deaths occur postpartum, um, and most of them are occurring after that six-week checkup, when women may not be, you know, seeking medical care for themselves um, at all. We also observe these just unacceptable racial and ethnic disparities in pregnancy-associated suicide death. American Indian and Alaska Native women are at far greater risk compared to their risk was about three times higher than that of white women and non-Hispanic white women themselves are relatively high risk for this outcome. Um, and we also think that the contribution of suicide as well as drug-related deaths and homicide to overall pregnancy um, associated mortality um, is probably a lot higher um, than unadjusted estimates would suggest. So I look forward to taking your um, questions. I think at the end is when we're going to um, be, um, be talking about all of this, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman and we, we appreciate the presentation and particularly because this data hasn't been shared widely yet. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that stunning statistic around indigenous women and appreciate that you have teased out that critically important data. I now have the pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Marcella Smid, who is a lead investigator around a study called the Pregnancy Associated Death in Utah, Con Contribution of Drug-Induced drug Deaths. She's also gonna be talking about some of her new research, which is going to be critically important in standardizing the way maternal mortality review committees begin to look at suicide. Um, Dr. Smid, happy to turn it over to you. Hey, thanks so much for the invite. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, so I'm a, um, I'm a clinician, I'm a maternal fetal medicine and addiction medicine specialist, and I'm the medical director of our of the SuperAd clinic, which no one knows what it stands for, even my residents and fellows, um, but it's our dedicated prenatal and postpartum clinic uh, for women with substance use disorders. Um, just like Cedra mentioned, I will use um, women um, here, but I also want to acknowledge that not all pregnant and postpartum individuals identify as women. Um, next slide. So I'm going to focus um, on the maternal mortality review committee process. So I've been on the Utah maternal mortality review committee since 2016. And so just to give um, folks a kind of a background on, on how MMRCs work. Um, so the, the intent of MMRCs is to review maternal deaths and to um, identify which of those are, are able to be prevented and then to come up with real recommendations to multiple bodies on how to prevent deaths. And this is all kinds of deaths, whether it's from hemorrhage or hypertension. Um, and increasingly, MMRCs are looking at drug overdoses and suicides. Our MMRC has been around for over 20 years, and it's a multidisciplinary group with medical um, providers that range from 
um, MDs, nurses, CNMs, um, we have family medicine docs, we have general OBGYNs, we have maternal fetal medicine specialists, we have um, neonatal um, docs as well. So we have a real um, breadth and depth of providers. Um, we have social um, workers, mental health and substance use experts. Um, when we are reviewing a death of a Native American individual, um, we solicit um, representation from tribal representatives. And um, we are trying to have a patient um, representation as well. We're, that's still a work in progress due to some of our confidentiality issues. And there's been great work um, over the past um, decade and really a lot of momentum even in the past five years since I've been on the MMRC that we now, um, when I started, we had about, there were about 30 um, MMRCs in the, in the entire country. And now there are 50 MMRCs, including um, three that are dedicated to cities, which is Washington DC, Philadelphia, and um, New York City. If you're interested in networking um, and finding out about your MMRC, this is the Review to Action website. It actually has an overview for every st um, state that has an MMRC the contact, how long it's been around, and who, you can ask questions, um, you can learn about your MMRC and even how to participate. Um, next question, or next slide. So, uh, so this, these are those deaths that we were um, just talking about that Shadir was presenting. So the role of the MMRC, and this depends, um, quite a bit on the state and how many deaths that they have. So in Utah, we're, um, we're very lucky in that we have, we kind of have the Goldilocks number of deaths in that we don't have so many deaths. Um, like for example, California just has so many deaths that they have to really be a little bit more selective about the ones that a full committee reviews. And then there are some states that have very few deaths just because of the, their population that they just don't have um, that much volume. And we're kind of, I think in this really, um, if you can be great about talking about maternal deaths, but from a data perspective, we're right in the in the middle where we have enough volume that we can really see trends, but we also have um, a committee that the, the volume that we can review all deaths. And so that's pregnancy associated deaths. So our committee reviews all pregnancy, all deaths that occur for a, a individual who was pregnant and up to a year from the termination of that pregnancy. And we also review, we don't just review deaths that end in a live birth. We also review miscarriages, terminations. Hey, so last month in August, Sorry? I didn't take pay. I didn't know what to do because I took- We will go ahead and mute the lines and I apologize for that. All right, thank you. We hit two Zoom bingos there. Um, I was talking while muted and somebody was, ta was talking unintentionally. So we've hit Zoom bingo. Um, so, I'll go. so pregnancy associated, right? So we look at all deaths that end, all pregnancy outcomes um, from the termination of the, or from the end of the pregnancy to for a year postpartum. And what we're trying to do is to distinguish between what are the pregnancy associated deaths and pregnancy related deaths. And this is um, really important. So the way that we define that pregnancy related death is that it needs to come from a pregnancy complication, a chain of events initiated by a pregnancy or the aggravation of an unrelated condition by the physiological effects of pregnancy. And what we're ultimately trying to answer is if the person who died had not been pregnant, would they have died? And that's really the, the role of the MMRC is to, is to figure out that it, is this pregnancy related? And if it is, what is, how can we prevent it? We on, at the, um, in Utah, and this is significant for how this relates to overdose and, and suicide, because we're, we have um, the ability to review all deaths, we were reviewing pregnancy associated deaths, which has sort of traditionally been um, viewed as more pregnancy associated and not pregnancy related. However, um, this has um, recently changed for us and we'll go over that now, so next slide. So this is um, a paper that we wrote um, on the left-hand side, you see that 26% of our deaths were drug-related. Now, this is a talk about, um, about overdose and, um, or about suicide. These deaths um, included suicide as well. If we included suicide in this graphic, it's a third of the deaths um, from, that were pregnancy-associated in Utah from 2005 to 2014 
were, preg were either over drug related um, overdoses, not thought to be suicides or suicides. And this was really alarming to us. Uh, and we went back to our committee. We, we really did a deep dive into these deaths and looked at what are the common themes? Um, I mean, I'm an addiction um, medicine specialist, so really this was very focused on, um, on drug-related deaths, but we were really doing this in tandem because there's so much overlap between suicides and, and drug overdoses. So we did a very deep dive into our deaths, looking at common themes, um, what, what screening procedures were going on, how are, how are providers um, screening, assessing, and treating, and referring to treatment. And what you see on the, on the graph on the right is that our pregnancy-related mor uh, mortality ratio increased from 2014 to 2015. So the question is, why did it go up? Um, and I'll answer that for you next. Um, next slide, please. So we came up, um, after we did this very deep dive into our um, overdose deaths and suicides, we came up as a committee with some standard criteria for how we would evaluate pregnancy relatedness as it specifically relates to drug related deaths and suicides. And so we these are the criteria that we have, we have used. Um, and this actually explains why our mortality ratio went up. And so we defined these as the pre a pregnancy complication. So for example, I'm gonna um, talk about B because that was our most common. So a traumatic event in pregnancy or in the postpartum period with a temporal relationship between the event leading to self-harm or increased drug use and a subsequent death. And we really viewed all, of, we looked at the, the years, the decades of deaths that we um, have reviewed and found that you can really relate it to any traumatic experience of so stillbirth, a preterm delivery, a diagnosis of a fetal anomaly, a traumatic birth experience, relationship destabilization with an intimate partner or a parent that was a main source of support due to the pregnancy. And so we, we define that if you can't, you um, have a child, right? That relationship is happening after, if that destabilization is happening afterwards, it is due to the pregnancy because that's how you got to the child. And then very importantly for drug-related deaths, removal of children from custody. Next slide, please. So those are the pregnancy, direct pregnancy complications. And then chain of, a chain of events initiated by pregnancy. So I'm going to um, focus um, the, uh, on this one, on um, the case examples were cessation, so cessation of attempted, um, sorry, cessation or attempted taper of medications due to pregnancy related concerns. So this can be either substance use pharmacotherapy like methadone or buprenorphine, or commonly psychiatric medications um, such as SSRIs or mood stabilizers for folks um, that were, were, were afraid of the fetal or neonatal effects. Um, next slide. And then the third category is the aggravation of underlying conditions by pregnancy. And this is um, the most common um, category identified in suicides. And so it's most commonly um, in Utah. So most commonly worsening underlying depression or anxiety or other psychiatric condition in pregnancy or in the postpartum period with documentation that mental illness led to drug use or self-harm and a subsequent death. And so this most commonly was pre-existing depression or anxiety or PTSD or other um, underlying mental health conditions, um, bipolar um, included in that, exacerbated um, by either that pregnancy or in that postpartum period that led to suicide. And that was certainly the most common in our experience for suicide deaths. Next slide, please. So when we looked at our, so referring to what happened in that, why did our, um, our pregnancy-related mortality ratio go up, when we applied these criteria that we had developed to our 2015 and 16 deaths, we were actually able to classify those deaths as pregnancy-related and really ultimately answering that question of, how, if this person had not been pregnant, would they have died? Uh, and we, for suicide deaths prior to this, had not classified any in 2013 and 14 prior to the development of these criteria as pregnancy related. But from 2015 and 16, we classified all of the deaths as pregnancy related because we had a structure to work with. Next slide, please. So now what we're doing is, so you're saying, well, this is Utah, right? So, well, Utah, I mean, lots of people think that Utah is a funny state. We are a funny state, but I've lived all over the country. We're not any funnier than any, anywhere else in the um, country. But these are um, the start of a national conversation. So we've developed these criteria, which are now in the um, MMRC world referred to as the Utah criteria. 
And with the CDC um, and one of my collaborators here, Christine Campbell, who's um, pictured at the top, she's a, um, a pediatrician who specializes in um, child abuse. She and I, and she's an expert in the Delphi method, we are in, um, barking in, a, in the Delphi method for national um, consensus for these, um, for these criteria. And we have um, solicited the opinion of each state, so every MMRC um, state and other experts, and we're currently in round three. So if you have been requested, there may be people on this call, that, and you are on this call, and you have an outstanding round three, please fill out your round three so that we can get to national consensus. This is really the start of this conversation um, in order to have all of us be, be speaking the same language, because if one state is um, classifying suicides as pregnancy related because we're applying certain criteria, the next state over may not be doing that. And then it looks like Utah, for example, has a much higher pregnancy related mortality ratio, but we, we, I, I suspect we don't, we just are, are applying these criteria in a different way. Um, next, I think that's the that's next slide. I think that is the end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I'm really looking forward to diving into some of the data with you during the fireside chat. I next have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Kara Zivin, who so many of you in the maternal mental health world and space know well. Um, she is not only an incredible researcher doing research in multiple places and spaces around maternal mental health, um, but she's also a peer with lived experience around maternal mental health and has experience to share around um, suicide personal experience. And we're looking forward to hearing from you, um, Dr. Zivin. She's also the lead investigator in a study called Trends in Suicidal Ideation and Self-Harm among privately insured delivering women. Um, Dr. Zivin, happy to turn it over to you. Great, thank you for having me. And can you hear me all? Yep, okay, great. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so I'm gonna step back a bit compared to the two prior presentations and focus on suicidality and self-harm. So not specifically looking at completed suicides. Um, in the data that we had, we, we were not able to determine um, actual causes of death. So we decided instead to look at the experience of suicidality, which is more common than actual completed suicide. And as we've already talked about, um, the CDC mortality statistics exclude suicide deaths and often suicidal ideation, self-harm are also excluded from information on maternal morbidity. Yet uh, trends remain poorly described and also are, are somewhat high. So I actually was not the lead author on this paper that uh, Joy just mentioned, but I was the senior author. It came from my study and I've listed the citation at the bottom. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to just give some background about our data. So again, we wanted to look at trends in suicidal ideation and self-harm also uh, noted together as suicidality in a large cohort of commercially insured childbearing individuals. So our data uh, came from Optum Clinformatics Data Mart, which uses United Healthcare data. Uh, from 2006 to 2017. And so this data source includes nationally, um, you know, commercially insured population across all 50 states. So it's, it's a, a large data source. And this was part of uh, my study funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health that we've called MAPLE, uh, Maternal Behavioral Health Policy Evaluation Study, um, where we included individuals uh, that we believed of childbearing age according to the CDC definition, so aged 15 to 44, that were continuously enrolled in a single commercial health plan for a year before and year after childbirth. So it's a somewhat restrictive definition, but we really wanted to be sure that we captured what was happening to these individuals during pregnancy and postpartum. And we use diagnosis codes in claims data that indicate, again, this idea of either suicidal ideation or intentional self-harm. So this is not based on medical record notes or, you know, interviews with the patient. So, you know, it's, it's an imperfect uh, identifier of suicidality, but it is what we, what we had. So on the next slide, 
um, I present the trends that we found. And so as you can see from the line at the top, there's more uh, suicidal ideation than self-harm, which makes sense. Um, and that both rates of both of these experiences increased over time in our study population. Um, on the next slide, we break this down a bit more. That was the overall trends. We also found larger escalations over this time period in a couple of different key uh, subpopulations, including the non-Hispanic Black population, individuals of low income, which we defined as uh, below 400% of the federal poverty level, younger individuals uh, aged 15 to 18, and those who also had uh, experiences of other mental illness comorbidities, including anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. Um, I also thought it was interesting to note that we looked both in the pre-delivery, so pregnancy and the, the few months before pregnancy, as well as post-delivery for um, indicators of suicidality. And we found that there was actually some uh, you know, large components of both groups that had uh, suicidality, so 45% in the pre-delivery, 58% in the post-delivery, and so there was actually an overlap of, of uh, almost 4% who had suicidality in both periods. Um, I also wanted to indicate here for you the, the rates of the perinatal behavioral health diagnoses. As you can see, uh, they all increased quite a bit over the time period from 2006 to 2017, uh, including depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and psychotic disorder. So we go to the next slide. So, you know, this work that came out, you know, almost a year ago now, I think contributed to literature, it actually got some, you know, press and attention focusing on this idea that suicidal ideation and self-harm increased quite substantially over you know, a 12 year period and that there were significant disparities in uh, patient subpopulations that experienced larger growths. And so when we think about trying to address suicidality as well as uh, completed suicide and maternal morbidity and mortality, this is a, a topic area that policymakers, health plans and clinicians should all try to consider in the pregnant and postpartum population, including screening and appropriate treatment. You know, it's not enough just to screen for mental disorders if there is no um, specific follow-up provided to the individuals who are experiencing symptoms. I think this is also important when we think about Medicaid and other health plans. Um, I, might, I have a new study that we're actually calling the SPRUCE study that's going to be bringing in um, Medicaid and to look at disparities in that population as well. Um, and in Medicaid, there's even more challenges than in our uh, privately insured population in trying to understand um, identification and treatment because um, people may be coming in and out of Medicaid eligibility rather than having consistent coverage during pregnancy and particularly postpartum. So I'm happy to address questions about this topic as well. I think we're I believe this is my last slide. Let's check on the next slide um, or whether we're going to be moving into the discussion with all three of us uh, to take your questions and comments. So thank you. Excellent. We are moving into our fireside um, chat discussion and we welcome all of you um, to submit questions in the chat that you may have. We see some of those are coming in now. Um, I welcome all of uh, the speakers to join me back here on the the virtual stage. Um, so I have a lot of questions um, about this really incredible data. I think at least one of our attendees has pointed out that you know, this is such complex work um, and can be very com confusing at time. We really just wanna thank you all for your contributions and sharing um, critical information today to help us um, really start to make more sense of the data. Um, so I wanted to start with um, you, Dr. goldman Malore, around um, the spike that we seem to see in 2018 that you mentioned um, and what, if you can just elaborate what you believe might have been happening there and then we'll invite our other two speakers to add um, any comments that, that they have relative to your feedback. I don't have any like any sort of clear 
you know, conjectures about that. And, you know, I should say like, I described it as a spike, but, but really like in any given year, the number of, um, of suicides is small enough that it, it leads to sort of instability in, you know, in these, in the, I don't know, in the, what looks like the rate, so like the, you know, in statistical terms, like the confidence intervals around that would be very wide. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know if we should really make too much of it. Um, I think what's sort of more important to focus on is kind of this, the overarching trend of suicide, you know, going up over the last, um, um, over the last 10 years. I mean, and like, I should contextualize that, like suicide rates among, you know, the entire United States in like pretty much every age and demographic group have been going up over the same time period. But, you know, it is, it's particularly alarming to see um, that pregnant and postpartum um, individuals are experiencing that same trend. That's helpful. Um, I think it, it, it was you, Dr. Zivin, that mentioned um, an increase over time in maternal mental health disorders from your claim data, uh, 20, 2006 through 2017. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on why we might be seeing that increase. Is it multifactorial? Any insight you want to share? Um, I think both in the cases of the, the suicidality and the completed suicides, part of it may have to do with real increases and some of it might have to do with reporting and how we understand what's happened and how we document it. So I think there's another <laughs> noise in the background that's that's not happening here. Um, but this idea of, um, you know, if people and clinicians, family, you know, if people are becoming more aware of the, the risk or the associations, they might be documenting it more. There's also the um, challenge that, the, the coding system that we use for diagnoses switched from ICD-9 to ICD-10 in 2015. And that may have had also a particular impact on documenting suicidality that should not have affected actual suicide deaths potentially, but at the same time, again, with increasing awareness, people might be noting uh, the presence of that. Because I think there's probably a number of suicides even now that are not coded as such, you know, whether they're considered accidents or, you know, accidental overdose or other things. So it's, it's an, a bit of an imperfect science to know for sure how much is reporting and how much is actual increases. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, I wanted to go back, I will turn it over to all of you to, to um, comment on this issue. Um, do you think there's opportunities around the 42-day limitation, the World Health Organization's sort of definition? Um, and Dr. Smid, you're nodding your head. Uh, why don't we turn it over to you to, to make a comment on that? And it does feel like there's so much energy happening around maternal suicide and maternal mental health awareness internationally at this point too. So appreciate your insight there. So, I mean, I think the, the short answer there is, um, yes, the, so the short answer is certainly multiple um, MMRCs, ours included, have consistently made this recommendation that Medicaid should really extend pregnancy and specifically here, pregnancy Medicaid, right? So you may be eligible. So your pregnancy at Medicaid extends depending on what state you're in six to eight weeks out. Um, and then you are no longer eligible for pregnancy Medicaid. You may be eligible for regular Medicaid um, afterwards, but that requires paperwork, document, you know, do, documenting your salary. And depending on if you're in a, an expansion state or not, you may lose that coverage. As we've, um, there are fewer and fewer states that are are expand are non-expansion states. That disparity has been, um, changed. But the, the recommendations of MMRCs for exactly these reasons, and it's for, um, and, I, and I sort of shudder at making the, disti like the distinction between physical health and mental health, because I think those are th the same and there shouldn't be a distinction, but particularly for mental health conditions, including um, substance use disorders and other mental health conditions, really that, that shift of making somebody go through paperwork to continue their healthcare coverage is a huge barrier and a huge gap in being able to access um, the services that they need. And what we're seeing here in the data is that there's um, six-week postpartum or eight-week postpartum if you're in a generous state, 
um, that's really when things are starting, right? That's, and I think there was a, a question about should there a two week um, mood check, right? There are gonna be certainly people that are starting to exhibit symptoms at two weeks. So I don't think that's too soon, but I think that it needs to extend out much further out really into that year postpartum at minimum um, and, and having that, those services available when your child is nine months old, right? It doesn't necessarily stop. It really, that's when we're starting to see things kind of escalating. And that's why we're seeing the deaths where we're seeing them, which means that there's a huge amount of morbidity that's happening um, underneath that iceberg of deaths that we can actually see above the surface. Thank you so much um, for those remarks. I, I'm seeing our other two panelists nodding their head and invite you to uh, make comments on this issue of postpartum Medicaid um, extension or pregnancy Medicaid extension. Um, and also anything that you wanna share relative to um, definitions around data tracking the 42 day uh, cutoff uh, around pregnancy. Is it associated, related, whatever term that might be. Um, I would appreciate your thoughts on that question too. Um, Dr. Goldman Miller, will you touch on that first? Try, yeah, this is, this is I, I'm not a policy person. I'm, so I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist um, by training, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a, a lot of evidence out there that they're, you know, in that period, um, in the postpartum period, when, you know, not all individuals are, you know, maintain coverage for a year, there's a lot of churning. Um, and like um, Marcella said, it's, it's such a, um, it's such a barrier to have to, you know, reapply for insurance, keep track of, you know, what's happening. Um, so, you know, I, I know that there's policy movements um, at, the, at the national level and, the, and at some state levels to um, uh, require or, you know, mandate um, a full 12 months of Medicaid coverage um, after, um, after a delivery. And like that, that's certainly something that the evidence suggests um, would be beneficial. Yeah, Dr. Zivin, why don't we turn it over to you? We know that you really do have an interest in policy and have been following this topic. Um, and anything else that you want to cover from a policy perspective, you hit on, um, several of you hit on sort of risk factors, pre-existing mental health disorders prior to pregnancy, et cetera. Anything else um, that you want to I know, I'm trying to track this and also look at some of the questions in the chat because I don't want to miss those either. I think, right, you know, as we've been talking about, it, it's a bit challenging, especially when we're talking about Medicaid, because every state has different policies and politics and, and things that affect, you know, how long people get care and which people get care and whether they're in an expansion state. And it really shouldn't matter what your zip code is, what kind of care that you get. And I mean, that's true for many conditions, not just perinatal health, obviously. Um, you know, and I think it's an interesting time to be following this issue because there are opportunities um, under what was the COVID relief bill uh, back in March that could allow states to have an easier opportunity to extend Medicaid postpartum, but that obviously depends on the state's willingness to do so. Um, and that really can affect individuals. And, and, and it's, it's very salient to the data that we've seen today, because if we're seeing suicidality or suicide deaths beyond when someone has coverage for health care, then they could be missing having access to care at a time when they may be really most desperately need it. And I think this idea that, um, you know, we recommend screening for mental health and substance use conditions during pregnancy and postpartum, at best that often happens maybe once during that entire period. And yet you can imagine, and I know from personal experience that how you feel at six weeks pregnant may be different at six months pregnant, which may be different at two weeks postpartum, which may be different at six months postpartum. And so, you know, not carefully tracking that can really be problematic. So I'm not hundred percent sure if I address the question and I see there's a uh, Crystal McCauley has a hand raised. Uh, we'll, um, we'll open it up for comments here in just a moment. Um, I've been kind of synthesizing some of what I see in the chat and where I want to take us next is to 
um, address this issue of intersectionality around um, drug overdose and suicide and sort of this issue of firearms, um, which we don't address. But did any of your data address firearms um, from some of the general suicide data? It does seem like um, firearms and homes uh, are a leading cause uh, of suicide or completion of suicide. Any thoughts, any data that you can share around drug overdose and this intersectionality issue? Um, why don't we start? Yeah, go ahead. I can speak, I guess, maybe a little bit to the firearm um, question. So yeah, I mean, in general, firearms are used for more, about half of all suicides. Um, I haven't specifically looked at um, the use of firearms but in the pregnant and postpartum period, nor do I know anyone who has done that, although it could be out there, I just might not be aware of it. Um, my guess would be that it's quite rare, um, which is you know not to suggest that it's not a concern, but, but my guess would be that it's quite rare. Um, when um, it's, it's simply because firearms tend to be used much more frequently by men, um, just in general. Um, when we, when, uh, when I was, uh, the, the paper that we published 18 months ago, we were looking at um, California data, um, and we looked a little bit into the means um, that women were using um, when they died by suicide. Um, it, it was sort of a, you know, a mix of, of methods, um, but I am not sure that there were any firearm suicides. Um, most of them were um, drug related or, um, or other kinds of um, mechanisms. Yeah, I appreciate that insight. Um, why don't we turn it over to you, Dr. Smith, to make some comments there as well? Yeah, so um, I'll make one comment about, so firearms, um, we've seen, and this is a sort of an informal um, count in my head as, as I think back to our deaths, um, we, we've, we've seen an increase in the use of firearms, in the, I would say in the last five years um, it, among women completing suicides. Um, but like we said, it's really rare. And, and, and another, so another um, thing is data ascertainment, right? So we, because of that, I started actually screening for firearms um, in my own clinic, but there's no place in the EHR to put that. So we've got a place for the EPDS. We have a place for GAD7, you know, we've got um, domestic violence. We've got, I mean, we, we've got so many places, but we actually don't have a button to click. Does this person have a firearm in their home? And it's a question that we ask, it's a question that the pediatricians ask, but it's not, docu I mean, it's not documented in a systematic way. It's usually documented in notes, which then makes you know, it hard to really um, do a systematic review. Um, in terms of the intersectionality between overdose and, and suicide, I think this is kind of where I, I, I live a lot. Um, and I think the comment that I'll make there is um, it's really hard to, to tease out even when you're, a, when you're looking at the MMRC data that's available, which is health records, right? So prenatal charts, autopsies, um, the police report. So we actually get a lot of data, but the, um, the question of did this person die by suicide or did this person die by an accidental overdose is often hard to answer for any for any anybody that's trying to sort that out. Um, and the medical examiner has two bright three boxes, um, ac natural, accidental, um, suicide, or actually four, un un unable to determine. And so one of the things um, that we are, are starting to see even from our, our Delphi method, but there's lots of discussions about this um, around the country for MMRCs is having a survivor interview because there's a lot of information that could be gleaned that's that's not available to MMRCs or really to, to investigators trying to figure out what did this did this person die by suicide or an overdose and does it matter and i think the answer to that is yes because people who die of an accidental overdose are not intentionally are, are not in the same place as a person who dies by suicide and the interventions while overlap a lot may have some important distinctions. Um, and so really understanding what, what the deaths are telling us. And one of the ways that we can do that is by having these survivor interviews, uh, which I think is happening around the country. And there's certainly, I mean, that, and that requires funding, right? And that requires training a specific person to be able to do that and to answer, to ask questions that are trying to get at the answer of, if, if this person had not been pregnant, would they have died? Right. Is it pregnancy related or not? And, and asking, did this, do you think this person was intentionally trying to, um, to end their life or not? 
And those are things that don't live in the medical record in a way that, um, that when you're trying to aggregate the data, you can find. So a role for qualitative interviews, I think, will help us tease that apart and then be able to really target interventions that, that may prevent these deaths. That's great. Um, and that role of interviews to really get to the bottom of, um, of intentional suicide versus drug overdose sounds critically important. And I believe a couple of states like California have begun to do that kind of work. Um, really helpful. Um, there's questions about screening. So we know that screening for maternal mental health disorders just generally can be complicated because of the range of disorders and confusion around intrusive thoughts and psychosis and all of these things. Um, that aside though, I'd like to just ask uh, you all or anyone who feels comfortable talking about maternal um, or suicide uh, risk and the ASQ is one questionnaire um, that we're familiar with. Any suicide screeners that you've been involved in with your research that you would like to, to mention um, today? And Cindy, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and drop in um, the tools that we've covered and some of our um, prior work in uh, the chat as well. We'll make sure we link to those when we um, send out the recording from today's session. Any comments on suicide screening? And if not, I think um, Dr. Zivin will turn it back to you to just give us another refresh on um, this study, this claims data study. And was it you know, what's interesting to me is the fact that obstetricians often don't submit claims because of capitated obstetric care. Um, so was this mostly behavioral health care claims? Was there, were there also emergency room department claims? Like anything more you want to share around your data? So it's a good question and we're still digging into it. You know, that was a first paper that came out of this study um, and it was fairly descriptive. So I believe, and I would have to double check, so don't hold me to this, <laughs> that we were looking for diagnoses of suicidality from any claim during pregnancy or postpartum. But I think you make a good point about well, who's making those diagnoses and does it vary by provider type? Because we know that obstetricians tend to feel, or at least can feel less comfortable making mental health related diagnoses and treatment. And so th that is an important question, or, I mean, it could have been any other kind of specialist as well, um, but that's part of like the main focus of the study, not only on suicidality, but in general, the differences in utilization as well as expenditures uh, during pregnancy and postpartum for individuals who have mental health and substance use uh, disorder diagnoses and treatments. So please stay tuned. <laughs> We're still working on it. Um, but yes. Well, we're scheduled um, for another uh, about 17 minutes, but we're going to do our best to begin to, to wrap up. I do want to ask um, each of you, um, you, we've learned today about the Maternal Mortality Review Committee process and how critical it is to dive into um, records and really um, understand what could be a potential maternal suicide, not just look at coroner death certificates. Um, also want to hear from you what you believe the role of and the perinatal quality committee in each state, which we believe most states are, are sort of gearing up um, around those kinds of interventions and what the intersectionality is around MMRCs. Um, I think Dr. Smith will start with you. There was also one other question that I'm gonna to toss to you while we have you, um, and that is the role of the review to action, the AMCHIP um, um, uh, organization and set of resources for MMRCs um, and anything that you want to share relative to support that's that's there, a question that's come up uh, here in the chat. Um, yeah, so the quality collaboratives are one of the um, most powerful ways of getting um, attention on these issues. So quality collaboratives, what's great about them is that they are tapped into um, the folks that are engaging with pregnant and postpartum individuals around the whatever state that you're in. Um, and, and they've increasingly now looked towards mental health and drug um, related deaths and drug related morbidity, um, not just deaths, um, but really the morbidity that comes along with these conditions. Uh, and, and they've, they, and we are very lucky here in Utah is that our quality collaborative and our MMRC, there are many people who overlap on those who are quality collaborative and our MMRC um, inform each other. 
Um, and I and I suspect I think that that's the way that it is in in most um, in most states. Um, but if it's not, I would certainly encourage that. Um, in terms of the review to action, I think that the review to action that's um, the the things that that I love about review to action is that it's really a synthesis of the trends that are happening around the country. So we're not talking about the silos, right? So Utah is doing something and California is doing something. These are, if it's happening in one state, it's almost certainly happening in another state. And it's the ability to synthesize those recommendations and make national recommendations that then can make regional changes and local changes, right? So it's national trends that then filter down into these um, through, through quality collaboratives. And that's really where the action starts to happen because it, it informs the hospital systems and the hospital systems then inform the clinics and then the individual providers are able to have you know access a website for example in Utah to locate referral um, locations I saw a comment in the in the chat OBs are resistant to so, sometimes very resistant to doing um, some of the screening because they they don't feel like they're trained well trained enough to do the the treatment, but then where are you going to send somebody? So we get into this catch twenty two of of how how do you actually address this problem? And I think that's where the quality collaboratives um, can really help to create these systems changes that then end up being the ability for a provider and a patient to make a plan to get to wellness. Excellent. Um. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um. I'm going to turn it back over. Uh, to Dr. Zivin and uh, Dr. Golden Allure to, to make some additional comments or any other closing remarks that you wish to make. So I admit because right now I'm principally focusing on administrative data, I don't have some of the death certificate data or the MMRC data that my colleagues have access to at this point. Um, to me, like sort of my overarching concern on this topic is just making sure that people are aware of it and that we document it. Like I, I personally find it frustrating that we focus on this division as, as Dr. Smith was mentioning of between mental health and physical health contributors to maternal morbidity and mortality. Although again, we do that outside of pregnancy as well. Um, when I think these things go together, obviously, and so, you know, you, to me, it would be great if the CDC data included those causes of death. And I understand they're, you know, they're balancing com competing demands and objectives, both nationally and internationally. But, um, you know, I think we undercount the burden of illness and that does a disservice to individuals. So uh, I hope by highlighting it through this type of forum is also, there's a lot of great written material coming out in this area. Um, that, that will shine a light on this topic. Wonderful, um, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a lot to add. I completely agree with um, the, the previous comments um, about important areas um, to, you know, to pursue and kind of focus on over the next um, several years. You know, I think one, one extra thing that I would highlight is um, that, you know, as, as utterly devastating as all of these deaths are, um, it really is kind of the tip of the iceberg of a much larger kind of, you know, burden of um, really acute distress and suicidality and depression and other mental illness and struggles with, you know, substance abuse that I think, you know, frankly, because of in part because of data limitations, I think is not focused on as much. And I think we're starting to, to see changes in that. I mean, I know the, the, the folks that I work with are you know, real, um, really emphasizing this. I know that Carson and, um, and her, um, her team um, are focusing on this, but I think um, we need to pay you know, more attention to the, to the morbidity and not, um, not just the mortality also. Wonderful. And Dr. Smith, any final remarks that you'd like to make? Um, well, I think since since you've logged on, you express you have um, the audience has expressed an interest in this topic. I think the the um, the the um, the way to honor women, I think, that have died and to hear their voices is to is to listen to and really dig into what we can learn from their deaths in order to address the severe uh, morbidity that we know is happening under the iceberg and 
And by doing that, we really are able to both honor the women that have already died and potentially intervene um, and improve lives of, of women who are who are living. Um, and I think that's the that's the um, amazingness of things like this, where people are logging on, they're listening to it, they're talking about it, and they're gonna and it's national. So we're having these conversations in our own world and making connections across, you know, substance use and mental health and physical health. Um, entities to really focus on this. And I think the momentum is happening. So I'm, I'm really hopeful. Um, I think this is a really hopeful time. Um, even though we are talking, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we have lots of other things going on. I actually think this is a quite a hopeful time and there's a lot of momentum around this. And I think we're going to see some big changes in the next, um, in the next few years. Um, and so while it's a, um, a, a weighty topic, I think we are moving in the right direction. Wonderful. And we will just wrap up. Um, we have uh, uh, emails to share here in just a moment on the next slide. And as we share those um, email addresses, I wanted to just wrap up by sharing that really the time is now um, with all of you, researchers, providers, patients, and all of us as advocates to continue to lift up the important need to address maternal suicide and improve maternal mental health screening, diagnosis, and treatment. And together, we really do have an opportunity to make a difference right now, both at a federal level with some incredible things that are happening like as we speak in the Build Back Better efforts and Senate budget reconciliation efforts, as well as at a state uh, a level with MR MMRC and PQC support. And 2020 Mom is happy to be working with our partners like MMHLA and Postpartum Support International to continue to raise up these opportunities with all of you. Um, and with that, we'd like to close by sharing our final slide today, which is um, a reminder, you've seen this come out um, from several of our organizations thus far, that um, it's really exciting that the very first issue dedicated or almost fully dedicated um, to maternal mental health of health affairs, which is really the leading journal on systemic um, change and research in, in the health field, um, is going to be released in just a few days. And uh, there will also be a corresponding webinar addressing maternal mental health. Again, one more indication that the time really is now for maternal mental health and maternal suicide prevention. And we thank all of our speakers today for sharing all of their in incredible work and how we're kind of piecing this important picture together. And we um, look forward to continuing conversations and lifting up your work. Um, thank you all for attending today. Take care. Thank you.